Welcome everybody to the third session of the Visiting Scholars Research Seminar Series uh, at the New School. Um, we will be kicking, kicking it off um, and I have the distinct pleasure of um, introducing the first research uh, presentation of the day um, by Gabriela Rosa, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Sao Paulo and a visiting research scholar at the politics department of the New School for Social Research. Uh, she coordinates a research group for gender and politics at the political science department of the Uni University of Sao Paulo, where she's also a researcher um, at the historical perspectives of popular sovereignty group, uh, working for more than 10 years at the Brazilian National Association of Graduate Studies and Research in Social Sciences. Um, her research interests are modern and contemporary political theory, gender studies, conceptual history, theories of representation, popular sovereignty, and constituent power. You will hear about these two uh, concepts, popular sovereignty and constituent power, in her presentation today, which is regarding constituent power and undemocratic understanding of popular sovereignty. I will hand it over to you now, Gabriela. Thank you, Shai, for this very kind presentation. And well, good morning, and thank you all for joining us today. Well, as you heard, I'm here to talk about my ongoing research project that will eventually and hopefully become my PhD dissertation. So it is a work in progress, and I welcome feedbacks and comments you may have. Before I start, uh, I want to especially thank Tanzil for the partnership in putting this seminar series together and also Silvana and the politics department for all the support. So, well, some of you may have heard about the wave of street protests in Brazil from June 2013 to 2016. They were organized at first against the raise in public transportation fees, and they grew to eventually be disputed by groups using at least three different grammars and modes of action. So, so the socialist, the autonomist, and the Patriot, which actually ended up being rather conservative, really. So these protests were defining political events, and a lot has changed in our country after it. One could even say that the extreme right-wing backlash we see now, marked by Bolsonaro's election in 2018, can be somehow related to the forms and effects of collective organization that emerged and spread after that time. But what is interesting to notice is that one of the famous chants on the streets was that a kind of sleeping sovereign, a giant, they meant the people, was finally awake and ready to be heard. Different claims were then put forward in the name of the people, be them the many, the poor, the patriots, or the ones who felt being left out of politics. It is inspired by claims like these, aiming to represent the people that I draw a connection between the concepts of popular sovereignty and constituent power. So in a way, what I want is to think about the possibilities of democratic legitimacy that can be drawn from the people. A subject which is at the same time fictional or at least abstract, but also very concrete and real as we could see on Brazilian streets. So I see popular sovereignty and constituent power as contested concepts, and that's very important. What we mean by them has political effects as these concepts are part of an ongoing struggle to define or describe the legitimate source of democratic power. This is why it seems very clever to say following Lucia Rubinelli that the constituent power of the people is, and I quote, in the eyes of the beholder, end quote. This means I do not account constituent power as a positive reality, as something that exists in the world and do not relate it to any specific event of popular participation in history or any institutional transformation. Quite the opposite, I am more interested in how such a vocabulary is used in relation to different forms of popular power. So in a word, my aim is to show how constituent power is portrayed as a connection between popular sovereignty and the exercise of popular power in democracy, but also how constituent power can be uh, can be seen as stressing this relationship. When we look at the connection, we can talk about the roles of citizens on Chilean constitutional process or Argentinian mobilization fightings for women's rights of, uh, to abortion. More examples 
show how popular participation within the institutions or against the institutions can lead to revisions on society's fundamental laws. But there are also tensions between the two concepts. So if we understand popular sovereignty as an arbitrary and unlimited power, it is easy to see how it could be used as a tool to put forward claims like minorities have to ascend to the will of the majority. And this is an actual quote from Bolsonaro's while campaigning. Here, the sovereign people are the majority. So the people who voted for Bolsonaro or the people who are willing to vote for him at that time, they are the ones who constitute the nation and have the arbitrary power to decide on the living conditions of the, minor the minorities. So the way I choose to deal with these connections and, ten and tensions between the concepts is by operating a dub what I call a double movement. The first step is to highlight the two different aspects of popular power usually related to the ideas of constituent power and to popular sovereignty. So in the one hand, we have constituent power of, or popular sovereignty in relation to the foundations of democratic political power. But on the other hand, we can look at the available means to properly exercise it, like representation, direct participation, referenda, but also protests, demonstrations, and all that can happen outside the institutions. So by stating this difference, then I suggest that the connection between democracy and popular sovereignty might not, might not be as obvious as it looks. Although they are frequently linked, ideas of popular sovereignty that, for example, rest on the general will, like the famous Rousseau idea, have been read as undemocratic once they dismiss the need for pu public and collective deliberation on fundamental political matters. This is also why we find many interesting works dedicated to democratizing popular sovereignty. To mention a couple of them, Nigel Binati advocates for a reveal in the modern conception of popular sovereignty. Her idea of democratic sovereignty accounts for different sides of political decision that can be also extended in time and beyond elections. The way she sees it, there is a virtual circle that can be built by the communication between representatives and society. From a completely different perspective, Judith Butler sheds light on popular sovereignty as a condition for democracy that cannot fully be expressed by any democratic order. It is an extra institutional power without which no parliament can be, be legitimate, but also that threatens any parliament with dysfunction or even dissolution. Here, Butler is talking about what she calls assemblies. There are public manifestations where the meaning of the people is contested as soon as it's stated. So as soon as someone claims that this is the people, there will be, there will, there will be contestations of it. This means that the idea of popular sovereignty is always newborn and always provisional. In these spotlighted cases, we find interpretations of popular sovereignty willing to dissolve its absolute character, making it possible to establish and govern our political communities in democratic terms. It is interesting how the popular sovereignty vocabulary still works to specify the popular origins of political power in democracies, but it's also used to suggest multiple possibilities of people's participation on decision-making, as we could see by Rubinati's sovereignty expanded in time and space and Butler's assemblies. This means not only that popular sovereignty has a central place in contemporary debates about democratic legitimacy, but also how it shows how disputed its meaning can be. But you may ask, why do I think this is important or even interesting? So one reason is that orthodox democratic theory, minimalist or elitist or whatever you wanna call it, that came up especially in the first part of the 20th century, reinforced the dangers of participation for stability of political systems, especially after the European totalitarian experiences. Also, some political theory has just avoided dealing with questions about constituent power, possibly due to the difficulty posed by its arbitrary or somehow retroactive features. So in a way, the result is an overlap between constituent and constituted power. And again, one of my dissertation claims is that there are significant differences between the foundational moments and the exercise of popular power within any institutional framework. 
But there is yet another problematic overlap to consider. So part of contemporary literature that actually deals with the tensions and contradictions of this subject, my subject, and there are plenty of people doing it, tend to collapse popular sovereignty and constituent power. The main consequence is that constituent power ends up being portrayed as the best formulation for democratic popular sovereignty. However, history shows that they are not one and the same. In fact, the idea of constituent power has been thoroughly used at least since the French Revolution also to limit popular participation. And authors like Sieyès argued that people should have a role only in electing constitutional assemblies, for example. This, <clears throat> the way I see it then, coupling popular sovereignty and constituent power is not necessary or even desirable, especially in democratic settings. It might be even the case that claims for popular power intended to be sovereign hide racist or sexist and classist definitions of who should be the people setting the norms and values under which others are living. As Bolsonaro campaign largely advertised, and I told you. This is not to say it is not important to democratize popular sovereignty and the exercise of constitutive power, but rather to argue that it is impossible to evade the tension between popular sovereignty and democracy. So to wrap up, I just want to highlight that my research endeavor is not longing for a definite answer of who are the people in our democracies. And I hope you can see after this presentation, I don't even think that's possible. Assuming the political as an open and contingent field, what, what I want is to show that political theorists, contemporary or not, are political actors as much as activists. To be more specific, the project is to better grasp what citizens and academics are doing when formulating specific claims about popular power using sovereignty and constituent power as a vocabulary. So being here at the new school, it seems inevitable to shift my attention to non-Western means to understand politics, sovereignty, and the people. Not to look for better definitions, but to find in here, I quote Quentin Skinner, not the essential sameness, but rather the essential variety of viable moral assumptions and political commit commitments, end quote. So in other words, as much as the past Western answered, answers have helped to illuminate my own questions about democratic legitimacy, it might be the right time to expand the horizons of possible theoretical alternatives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have All right. Okay. Sorry about the mute unmute situation. Thank you so much, uh, Gabriela, for that uh, wonderful uh, presentation of your work and your research. Um, the floor is open to questions and comments and discussions um, by anyone who would like to pose one. Osge, you raised your hand. Yes, please. Okay, that works. <laughs> okay, thank you. I cannot unmute myself. So, um, so Gabriela, thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. And uh, I would like to ask you if you can give some concrete examples from the field about your presentation, please. Thank you. Should I answer? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, apart from these uh, examples I've been giving about, especially looking at the June 2013 and to 2016 um, manifestations and, and popular mobilizations in Brazil, 
one can think about, uh, I mean, that's generally been happening, I think, everywhere in the globe. So you have, uh, for example, the US claims to represent the people that are very uh, conservative and, you know, usually uh, meant to restrict uh, popular rights. But the thing is, uh, I'm not actually dealing with concrete examples in my research as well, they're just a way really to explain what I mean by the theory I've been looking at. So uh, I'm not actually dealing with field work or anything uh, so much as doing the, the theoretical sort of like concept uh, work on trying to look at what they mean by doing these kinds of things. So um, in this way, these concrete examples are used in, my, in the way I organize my, my research in order to uh, explain or show different uh, conceptions of popular sovereignty and constituent power that might be clashing between each other. And, and then uh, the best examples I have uh, would be the ones from June 2013 to 2016, like obviously due to being from Brazil and being in those manifestations myself, where we have, uh, as I mentioned, three uh, completely different sort of like grammars of manifestation. So you have the, what we call the socialist or which was like a lot more common. I mean, like leftist uh, claims and all of it. it we also had an autonomous uh, claims, which are also like from the left, but they claim more of like a, a self-organized movements. Uh, and they were usually a bit more violent, uh, especially against uh, banks and institutional buildings in general. And we had, which was the new thing, uh, the, the Patriots, what we call the Patriots. So they use national symbols like Brazilian flag, Brazilian soccer team uh, shards and Brazilian you know, national uh, symbols uh, to mean that they were the actual people. And one funny thing is that they actually claimed for a long, long time, that they were the ones uh, who weren't being heard, mostly, you know. So they claimed that they were out of the streets. They were reclaiming the street space in that situation because the right wing, uh, the right, the conservatives or the right in Brazil wasn't really uh, very famous for public manifestations or demonstrations or whatever. So they claimed the streets as a place for them to be, and that changed completely our political setting and agenda because they've been doing that forever now and in a way that they actually claimed for themselves all our national symbols like all of it like you don't use the brazilian flag anymore if you're you know organizing yourself from the left or if you're against these conservative settings and all of it so yeah, yeah. thank you very much uh Tanzil. Hi, Gilfie. Thanks very much for a really illuminating talk. I'd, I'd really love to, to read the thesis once it's done. Um, so I have two questions. Um, one is about this idea of the people um, uh, as, as a... And, and uh, the kind Daniel, of, we aren't able to hear you the, 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 um, very clearly. Is it possible perhaps you could turn your video feed off uh, so your audio would be clearer okay is, is that any better yes it's improved it's improved okay so um two questions i had one um is is there a possibility that um a conception of the people which um isn't kind of um doesn't capture everyone might actually be um a good thing now you, you're talking about the problem ways in which the people have been uh, articulated as racialized gendered um classed um and um some of the literature I've read, um, certainly through kind of kind of materialist lens, looks at how the conception of the people, conceptualization of the people, um, as this kind of uh, homogenous community is often really reifying certain 
uh, like class interests. And, and so I'm thinking about like the work of um, uh, Chantal Mouffe and Laclau and their kind of agonistic politics. Is, is there a, uh, could, could we conceptualize of a people which is, which produces a more kind of um, emancipatory constitutive power? But what might that mean uh, for the tensions with uh, democracy? But forgive me if that's not a particularly clear question, I'm just thinking out loud. And then the second one, which might seem un unrelated, what, what do you think about citizens' assemblies? Sorry, what, what assemblies? Citizens' assemblies. Citizens' assemblies. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, for the first part, um, I actually do think it's a good thing that we don't have a, a reified or a, un, like a sad concept of the people in general. Uh, and I do think that being a, like being, it being dispute is actually democratic or more democratic. So uh, I would go for the tensions on these concepts. And, and I think in a way then, and Butler is right to think that every time this, these meanings are posed, they already have opposition, you know, and, and I think that's part of democracy. And it might be a good part of democracy or a bad part of democracy, but it's something we have to deal when we're dealing with democracy in a way. Which what is tricky is that uh, I think by sometimes by thinking that we can question the meaning of the people and, and deal with these tensions that might be there, we can move towards a very um, uh, challenging and, and sometimes even uh, dangerous way of thinking that we can withdraw rights from minorities or for, from groups that we don't think belong to the people. So there's also, uh, and then what I, what, I what I think is tricky, but is also uh, interesting to think about it, what will be the criteria <laughs> that we like build on to make sure that we are not uh, taking, taking people's rights and these kinds of things when we're dealing with these conceptions of people. But I do think uh, in general, this is a good thing that they're contested. They should be contested as, I mean, because things change uh, in years and, and you have different, maybe with the refugees crisis, for example, you have to change meanings of who are the people in many countries uh, right now and all of it. So I do think it's a good thing, but I do think that I mean, it might have a down, a downside, which is just sometimes it's just democratic, but sometimes it also overturns democracy. So might might be thinking that democracy has some somehow the seed like to actually be overturned in itself. So we have to take care of it and how we build our institutions and our democratic values within society, which is I think one thing that's very important. Uh, um, I wouldn't go like on, on Lacalau's and Mufi's understanding of, of uh, actually uh, ten, like agonistic democracy. I, I, I do find it a very right, like a very useful understanding for many of things I'm thinking, but that's mostly because uh, they're, they're dealing with a very, I'm sorry if I'm being, being like very specific for the others, but they're drawing from Carl Schmitt. And I don't really think that's the best way to do it most of the time. Uh, I, I, uh, about the citizen assemblies, I think citizen assemblies uh, are very, I mean, the way, the way they're set in our contemporary democracies, they're set in a very representative environment. I mean, they're not, I mean, you build on representation. I mean, I, I don't really think we can deal with uh, the ideal of the direct participation that sometimes is behind our minds when we're thinking about citizens assemblies. So thinking about citizens assemblies as a form of a kind of direct participation built within a, a framework of representation that actually leads to uh, decision-making at the end, I do think there are very good things. And I think not just because of you know including people and actually hearing people, but also for the more formative, you know, and, and politically formative uh, roles of these uh, experiences of participation that sometimes 
end up being lacking in our democratic culture and uh, end up being uh, turning into what we see, for example, with the Brazilian uh, right wing uh, experiences of participation. They are very exclusionary and uh, very violent most of the time too. Like not just violent in a way of like actual violent, but they're very violent on their languages and on the things that they want to claim. Great, thank you very much. Um, Janaina? Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, Gabi, uh, thank you so much for sharing um, some of your thoughts with us. I'm really happy to, to be with you all this morning. Uh, so I, I understand that you have a, a time frame. Uh, because I, I, yeah, I understand that your perspective is very theoretical uh, to deal with these conceptions. Um, I just want to think about, um, for example, um, the Bolsonaro government, in a way, has ruined the possibility of popular participation. Uh, as, you, as you said, is a, the extreme right in Brazil is really violent uh, in so many ways. So uh, I just would like to hear a little more about it uh, because in fact, this is close to what I have been researching and it's my, it's a particular worry. Uh, actually, it's my worry right now. So thank you so much. That's it. Thanks Janaina for your question. So I do work with a time frame, but this is not the time frame. Uh, I mean, I'm not, as I said, I'm not doing field research or anything. So the time frame I'm, I've been looking at is contemporary political theory, which is a very broad time frame if you, if you think about it. But I'm trying to focus on actual authors that are dealing with these concepts of popular sovereignty and constituent power and trying to figure out what they mean together or if they're close and if they're opposite. Uh, I mean, we have, a lot of, of examples of that and, and Professor Kalivas here at the New School does it, uh, Professor Andrew Arato here at the New School does it too. So I'm, I'm talking about, uh, the, so my time frame is more theoretical, but uh, obviously uh, Brazilian experience uh, in, inspired the way I actually can look at these problems because they're not only just theoretical problems right now, they're very concrete ones. And that's not only a result of Brazilian experience as much as a global, you know, uh, shared uh, right-wing backlash we've been facing. So in the way what happens is that these um, contemporary, and I'm talking about after 2010 in general, I mean, what happened, especially in Brazil, but elsewhere too, after, 2010 with this right-wing backlash and these uh, conservative movements actually uh, being a lot more vocal and violent about their claims and being uh, very, uh, especially uh, feeling comfortable about talking to these, uh, to general people about re uh, things that were uh, beforehand, at, at least in Brazil, not very uh, well accepted, like racism and things like that or, or uh, withdrawing women's rights and these all these really problemat problematic views with uh, I mean with indigenous populations also that we had I mean we have been working on on granting their uh, rights and it has all been uh, destroyed right now so I think the way this informs uh, my my research is by actually uh, giving me uh, con real life challenging examples on how theory can actually respond to these movements and to these, uh, uh, to these movements, to these ideas, to, and to this new setting we're dealing with. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to pose a question um, before anybody else um, um, adds to the conversation using my moderator's privilege. Um, I, I, I wanted to draw parallels to the context where I come from, where there are a lot of theocracies and um, the, the concept of legitimacy um, based on a the, the theocratic thinking is less associated 
with the population and you know, the source of the leg legitimacy is divinity, it's divine authority. Um, they are legitimate because you know, a sacred text said so and because they associate to a certain um, theology or faith. And so that discourse becomes extremely limiting. And so looking at uh, your thesis of um, trying to link popular sovereignty to constituent power, and you know, my understanding of what you were presenting is that um, you're saying that a lot of people instrumentalize uh, popular sovereignty, they use these symbols and further their own cause, and you're saying they might not necessarily be legitimate. This is a very familiar argument because, you know, right wing re religious groups also use the very similar line of argumentation, uh, saying that, oh, well, the people don't know any better. We know we know better because of, you know, scripture and whatever. So um, I'd like to hear a bit um, about your thoughts on whether you think that the limits of popular sovereignty are being contested by various you know, narratives and various movements um, uh, across the world and whether that has any role or influence uh, in your work. Well, that's a very good question and very challenging. Uh, first of all, because uh, most Western theory on, on popular sovereignty and democratic legitimacy itself uh, draws the legitimacy of governments from the people. And that can mean a whole lot of things that I've been trying to show you, but uh, there is no way around it. So it is very, very difficult to think about any other source of legitimacy within the democratic framework that is not in a way drawn from the people. This means, in one, one, one of the things that this means is that uh, pushing democracy away from the West the way uh, we actually have done it or the way we try to do it and try to like just substitute whatever regimes people like different uh, parts of the globe might have with democracy, the way we see it might not work. And you're just stating one of the reasons that might not work. It doesn't work because the way uh, legitimacy is perceived in different places is different. And that's not just, I mean, I'm not just talking about uh, theocracies as we could say, I mean, this is not a way, not a good way of govern, government or is authoritarian or is autocratic or whatever. I'm also talking about uh, different uh, native experiences of political organizations that you can have in different parts of the world or even in the West, they're not really thought as Western for, I mean, native Brazilian experiences of, of of self-government, for example. So uh, I, I do, and you're right, that this is then very challenging, but one, of, one way of thinking about it is not actually questioning the, the popular side of the concept on popular sovereignty, so much as questioning the sovereignty side of the concept of popular sovereignty. And thinking about, uh, ways of dealing with these challenges that actually uh, refrain from thinking that there might be a popular power that is at the end arbitrary or unlimited or whatever it is, which doesn't mean on the other side to actually frame it into forms of institutions that block any changes or that channel all the changes within a non or organized institutional framework, I suppose that, I mean, the way I think it, that must be space for, you know, demonstrations that are against institutions or against what, what is there, in a way politically there and socially there. But, so my call would just, would just say to be that maybe the good way to actually incorporate your questions and other experiences into the way I look at it is to, not just not so much as to you know contest the, the popular part of the concept but more the sovereignty part of it maybe substituting it for other kinds of ideas like i don't know self-determination or other other ideas or concepts that would uh, be 
better suited to deal with different uh, settings, but also that would be better suited to different experiences that are not Western experiences in a way that we're not trying to impose a best, you know, what we call the best way of like a government, which is democracy. And sometimes I feel just because uh, that's how things have been in a way. I mean, why we choose these, I mean, there's plenty of reasons why we choose democracy, but why is specifically this word to mean this type of government we uh, deal with as the only legitimate one? I don't know. I don't think I answered your question. I have to think about it, but as a first reaction, that would be what I say. Uh, no, great. That was great. Thank you so much uh, for that response. Um, Uzge? Yes, thank you. It was a really good question, Shoaib. <laughs> thank you. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a great question and uh, there's a lot to think about that. And I just wanted to still on the field. <laughs> it's normal because I'm working on the field. Sorry. <laughs> just a question. Excuse my ignorance, but the, the the part, the patriotic part that you're talking about, they, do they have any kind of uh, religious aspect in their nationalism or it's just national feeling in general? No, they do. I mean, Brazil is a very Christian country in general, uh, being it like Catholic or evangelical uh, in general. So they do have very um, religious oriented claims that are relating to you know, the family and, you know, the, the, they're very conservative in this way. I mean, which is somehow mixed in Brazil, like this conservatism with uh, religious backgrounds on, you know, protecting the family, uh, keeping gender roles. So we had all these crazy things about, you know, men and boys wear blue, men, like women, girls wear pink and all these kinds of like crazy things. And, so there is this, and there is this also fear of you know, um, LGBTQI whatever claims that come around. Uh, so it is it is very religious in this way. I mean, we had we had crazy 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 claims during the elections about what was happening. So one claim that was put forward by Bolsonaro was that we actually had what they call a gay kit being distributed at schools, like primary schools, teaching kids how to be homosexuals or whatever. And obviously there was a big fake news, but that affected a lot of people. And I think as Xavier is, is mentioning, uh, affinity with new Pentecostals. Yeah, that, that's, a, um, that's not very new in Brazil, but the, the actually their political space is becoming uh, big, much bigger and they're, you know, in a lot of ways, they're a lot more radical than the, the Catholics in Brazil, like these new Pentecostals, evangelicals, uh, activists, but also politicians. There, there, there are a lot of politicians there, like from these backgrounds. So, yeah, it is a bit crazy in a way, but it's also very religious in these specific ways that are all related really to maintaining the, this idea of family. Great, thank you so much for that, uh, Xavier. Yeah, uh, just thank you for, for the presentation, very interesting. Um, I, I also wanna come a little bit from my, from my own context because um, I think that this idea of um, constituent power and popular sovereignty is not something that only happens in a right-wing context. Like in the case of Mexico, there has been, um, like an insistence on creating new referenda for more like a direct participation, popular consultations on, on political matters. Um, and, and I don't have any, anything against that. Uh, what, I, what I do find troubling is that um, a lack of participation in this, in this exercise is then is con construed as a, a treason, a treasonous act. Um, so I think that is, a, that is an issue that, um, and I think that it was very interesting how you opened um, your presentation saying that there is no certain monolithic term to describe that people. And I think that the issue with it is that, I think it's good that we don't have 
any any formal reified um, definition of it. But I also think that because we don't have one, it's very easy to instrumentalize it in order to gain certain advantages. And because it because it is pluralistic, it can be taken by by any side and be turned for any for any purposes. Uh, so, I, I I mean I guess my question would be, um, what would be a if, if you're saying that popular sovereignty and constituent powers should are, are, shouldn't necessarily be equated to the same thing. What would you consider uh, as a as a ideal sort of substitute for um, for constituent power that would not be popular sovereignty? Because yeah, we we've seen that it's problematic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the dissertation, like the million dollar dissertation question. I'll probably answer <laughs> at the end of it. But uh, to try to answer, I mean, you, I think you're completely right that there are. Uh, problems when we think that these concepts can be and are contested. So, because it happens exactly what you described. They're open for people. And usually that is, this is not very equal in the way that we're not just talking about like discursive, really equal play field where people are, you know, trying to build up a consensus or some sort of consensus about it. There's also power, financial power, political power that actually makes it easier for one one notion of the or the other to you know win this competition each time so uh thinking from that what i what i would look at is how how we can actually think about it and that's very tricky for for political theory but we should maybe think about how institutions also translate these concepts and I wouldn't, I mean, my, my, my political scientist colleagues are usually very, very aware of, you know, the institutional effects of it, which is not so much what I'm looking at. But what I do think is, I mean, how the how these ideas of like constituent power and that the people have the right uh, to decide and to self-determine the, like the way they want to live. So how these things are translated into institutions in different times, it's very important. One, in, in a very basic way, because institutions are also a way to prevent uh, these uh, new political ideas that might come and that might be, you know, uh, very conservative or very anti-democratic to actually uh, destroy what we've been building on, on democracy. So, and we see that, for example, in Brazil, even though we have all these problems, uh, there's some res some resisting institutions that might be what, what we're really relying on, <laughs> at least until October, when we get elections again and get the chance to elect Lula for president, which I hope it happens. Uh, and I mean, that's our, uh, sup uh, Supreme Court for the electoral system. We have like a, a Supreme Court that is actually handling the elect the elections in the electoral system. And that's something that has been uh, rather protected and that might be our chance to actually take down Bolsonaro, for example. But also we do think that four more years with Bolsonaro might probably destroy every last bit of the democratic institutions that have been you know, fought on and organized throughout all these years. So. Uh, that's one way of thinking about it. But the, the other way I, I'd like to think about institutions is that because they're made from people. So there are concept, like disputed conceptions of, of these ideas that get some sort of like uh, crystallized on institutions at each time. So you can see in a way who was the winner at like of these debates on each time by looking at how institutions actually translate these concepts and how they, they actually frame what is popular participation and how to deal with popular participation. So that's also one other reason which I think it's very interesting to see how institutions translate ideas. Uh, but thank you for the question. It is like the big question of my dissertation and I'm happy to talk about it like after if you want. Great, thank you so much. Um... If there are any further comments or questions from the participants. Um, Osge, you had another question? 
Okay, that was a, okay. I didn't see the, I misread the icon. So um, great. Um, thank you so much, Gabriela, for that uh, wonderful and very exciting uh, presentation of your work and your research and a very stimulating set of questions and answers um, afterwards. We learned a lot and I think we um, end your presentation a bit smarter than when we started it. So um, that well, is- I'm the... happy for that. <laughs> thank you, Chai. Thank you for moderating for all this generosity. And who we'll watch your presentation right now? So um, I'll start by saying that I'm very happy that we're here and that you're here presenting with me. I do think we have a lot to talk about our works in general, but so that you know Schwab, Schwab Rahim is a visiting scholar at the New School and the Associate Professor of Practice and Management at the American University of Afghanistan. He, he has over a decade of senior management experience in various sectors from urban governance and defense to conflict resolution and peacemaking. He is the former acting mayor of Kabul, running a city, a city of over 6 million and serving on the national cabinet of Afghanistan. He was also the member of Doha Peace Talks, a member of Doha Peace Talks, sitting across the table to the Taliban prior to the collapse of the Republic. As an alumni of Duke University and a Fulbright scholar, he's currently co-authoring a book on the recent collapse of Afghanistan's National Army and how a series of poor decisions over the years led them to this point. He's also leading a seminar at the new school named Decades of the Republic in Afghanistan, exploring various elements of the country's recent past, what, what he's talking to us about today. So Schweib, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Gabriela, for that very kind introduction. Um, I'd like to start off building the context um, of the work and the research that I and two other colleagues are working on, hoping to come up uh, uh, at the end of it um, with, uh, with a book, ideally, but otherwise um, we'll see where the research takes us. So um, in less than two weeks, uh, the Afghanistan National Army units across the country disintegrated one after the other. Uh, and on the morning of August 15th, 2021, the Taliban encircled Kabul, Kabul the capital of um, Afghanistan. Uh, it appeared that uh, the Afghanistan National Defense and Security Forces had fallen apart. Um, the collapse came as a surprise throughout the years, despite allegations of corruption and factionalism, these forces had maintained their credibility in the public eye as a national institution worthy of support. Although they suffered from high uh, casualty and attrition rates and faced logistical and funding constraints, they held off the Taliban offensive even as the presence of foreign troops waned and reduced drastically. Um, how then did the sudden and quick collapse and, and demise of these forces come about? That is the essence, of, the essence of the question that we're trying to ask. There are multiple narratives uh, which quickly surfaced as to the, uh, as to the reason and causes behind this in, disintegration. Um, in the days after August 15th, justifying his withdrawal decision, US President Joe Biden said that he would not keep American troops in a war that Afghans were not willing to fight themselves. So this is one major element of uh, um, uh, what we're trying to look at. Was this the case um, across the board? Was this not the case? If it was in certain parts, what was the motivation behind it? Another explanation lay with former President Ashraf Ghani's abrupt departure from the country and its disastrous impact on the chain of command um, of the security forces. In fact, the disintegration of the security forces was not a sudden event um, catalyzed by these immediate, uh, uh, immediate causes, uh, but rather a complex process of gradual and nonlinear decay in which many complementary and competing factors uh, from the force design and distrust between the soldiers and their leaders to the US Taliban withdrawal agreement, which happened in Doha, and the problem of pervasive corruption uh, all played a role. 
And the objective of this research is to look into each of these elements and try to find the relationship that these elements have with each other, but also how they contributed to the eventual collapse, uh, the disintegration of the army, which led to the collapse um, of the Republic. And so there are five elements and themes um, that I want to very briefly um, present, which is the um, uh, focus um, of, of our research. First is the issue of the design and the rebuilding of the national army now, um, and how that took place and where they went wrong. Second is um, Ashraf Ghani's distrust of his own army and the series of coup proofing measures that he took. Uh, third is the negative impact of the Doha deal on the battle, uh, the battle lines. Uh, this is the deal that was signed between the United States and the Taliban. Um, fourth is the compromised legitimacy um, of the state. Uh, and uh, the fifth is the escape of Ashraf Ghani. Was it was what was the rationale and what were the what were the facts that were behind this sudden uh, uh, sudden escape? You have to understand that this research is taking place in an extremely polarized uh, space and context inside Afghanistan, where uh, due to massive personal loss and collective loss, um, and uh, because of the collapse of the republic. Um, the 35 million uh, people living in the country and the hundreds of thousands which were displaced and have lost their homes, you know, uh, uh, including myself and many academics and, and uh, former civil servants. Um, the, the research has to be as objective and as vetted as possible because it will be heavily contested. Uh, and so we take these elements and we take these uh, uh, factors very seriously in terms of making sure that the 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 final judgment or at least the the the, the picture we paint is one that is considered to be credible um, and one that is not considered to be subjective or politicized um, so on the first one the design of the national army so the national army the, the united states and nato were not initially interested in, in, in funding or supporting or setting up the National Army of Afghanistan, because they were like, we're already here, we're fighting the Taliban already gone, we're fighting Al Qaeda and the terrorists, we don't need. But after insistence, and they, they succumbed to it, they designed um, and supplied and equipped and trained the National Army, not as a standing conventional army to protect the national integrity and the, and the security of the country against threats, domestic and abroad, but as an annex force to serve somewhat as protectors of the American and NATO forces and bases across the country. This, uh, this So it was almost like a side effort. It was not one of the main efforts uh, that was going on. In terms of, in terms of uh, the amount of resources, so uh, there depends on which, which figures you use, but at, at most, the resources committed to the reconstruction of the Afghanistan National Army and Security Forces was, was 3%, 3% of the total investment across 20 years on, on the, specifically the war effort. We're not talking about the, the civilian investment and the non-security non investment. So 3% was invested over 20 years. And by other claims, less than 1% was invested. And so it was a design and reconstruction of the national army, which was supposed to fend off the Taliban and maintain the republic and the demo democratic institutions, which were fragile to begin with, was, was an afterthought. And in 2014, when the initial phase of the drawdown happened from 120,000 troops, it, the, the drawdown came down to 10,000 international troops present across the country. The bulk of the war effort was shifted towards the national forces. The national forces were not ready. The force placement was not correct. The training, the equipment, the contract 
and the supply chain, which is which would supply the soldiers with with food, ammunition, armory, etc., was all privatized and contracted. And so, and so the only way that the national army could uh, 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 preserve or make sure that the, the country is not lost is by throwing bodies at the war. So the casualty rates were extremely high. Um, and at the peak of the war, um, uh, which usually at the summer, the peak of the war, we've had up to 1,400 casualties per day from the National Army Police and Security Forces. And so Basically, and the total number being around 70,000, uh, that's a very conservative figure, 70,000 troops um, uh, killed in the, in the line of duty. And so the question then becomes, was there a deliberate misrepresentation of the capabilities of the army by the Pentagon and by NATO to kind of demonstrate uh, 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 or justify the withdrawal at the pace they did? Um, and that is that is something that um, we are trying to look into and we're discussing and we're interviewing uh, decision makers, American decision makers, uh, Afghan decision makers, uh, senior military officers who were involved in these uh, trajectories, because the hope was that the army can sustain because the reference points was the Soviet withdrawal back in the 90s. And the fact that the army at that time was able to survive an additional three years. Um, but then eventually collapsed. So that's the first element. Second is the coup proofing. Ashraf Ghani did not trust the security forces for a variety of reasons. And so he very systematically undermined and politicized the security forces in terms of appointing friendly generals and appointing friendly military officers in various layers of uh, the army uh, and the police. And he empowered the National Security Council of the country to control and oversee the defense minister, interior minister, and the head of intelligence. And so everything was centralized at the palace. And so one of the reasons why his fleeing and his escape became so consequential was because all decisions had to be vetted by the palace and by the National Security Council. And he sat on the, uh, um, and so he was the commander in chief. He kept on reminding everybody that he was the commander in chief. So when the commander in chief fled, the chain of command broke. Uh, um, and so this, and this stemmed from a mentality that he had that the army, I cannot trust the army. And because we have a history of military coups um, in the eighties and nineties, that fear um, uh, drove his specific focus of undermining and containing and controlling, which all played out in favor of the Taliban, uh, this, this somewhat sort of infighting. Third is the Doha agreement between the Taliban and the United States, which completely bypassed the government of Afghanistan. It was not a, it was essentially a handover deal. It was viewed by the troops it was viewed by the troops as um, a betrayal because uh, the narrative that ran by the Taliban was that, look, it's a done deal. Why are you fighting us? The Americans have signed an agreement with us. It's done. And so this drastically increased desertion rates and, and, and uh, affected troop morale. It legitimized the Taliban uh, um, regionally and domestically. And so it had a very, uh, uh, very negative impact on the war. Um, looking into the details and logic of this and how that translated, how a peace process, uh, how a peace process is instrumentalized in a war by one of the conflicting sides is the aspect we're looking at. Fourth is the issue of the legitimacy of the state, where in 2004, our first ever presidential elections, we had over 70% voter turnout. Fast forward in 2019 presidential elections, we had um, less than 1 million people, so that's 5%. From se over 70%, we dropped down to 5% of eligible voters who participated. And this is because over the course of two decades, um, the systematic corruption in the election and the fraud in the election not only undermined its credibility, but the fact that the, 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 the fraud 
And the perception was that the fraud was given the green light by the Americans and by the Europeans because they, their favorite candidate would come in power and not the Islamists or not the ones that are not considered friends of the West. This strongly undermined the legitimacy of the state and it affected the, the cause and the purpose where, uh, of fighting for an army. And this is a volunteer army. This is a, not a draft army. It's not, military draft is not compulsory. And so, and so the military question what it is that they're fighting for when the commander in chief comes into power through election fraud. Um, and so it became a very polarized and contested political sphere where opposition parties, it became so bad that they were claiming that it's better that the Taliban come to power as long as we get rid of Ashraf Ghani. And so that kind of polarized political space also contributed a lot to the uh, collapse. Finally, the element we're looking at is the um, actual escape of Ashraf Ghani and his team on August 15th. The big question here is, um, uh, did the escape cause the, was that, the, was that what broke the camel's back? Was that the event that removed any opportunity to salvage a political reconciliation or to defend Kabul? Or was it already a lost cause and nothing else could have been done? Regardless of his personal cowardice and his deceit and his lies, which is, you know, it's, it's you know, history and everyone is judging him for it. Um, um, the, our research, what we're trying to determine is what could have been possible if he had not escaped in that manner. And so, and what could we have salvaged anything? And so looking at these five elements, we're trying to, and we're trying to paint uh, 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 the picture of the context within which the war was taking place. And the final piece, uh, in addition to these five elements, is we're actually working on documenting the, 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 the war. Everybody's just focused on Kabul. Everybody was focused on the uh, Ashraf Ghani's escape. But the battlefield and the war is won or lost outside Kabul. Kabul is usually... Uh, defended or collapses due to the other parts of the country, the West, the North, the South, being able to fend off the Taliban or any other types of insurgency. And so these are the questions that we're trying to explore and trying to uh, uh, basically simplify a very complex uh, scene, reality, not only for our own people in Afghanistan, but also for a lot of the international uh, policymakers and uh, you know quote unquote experts of Afghanistan who everybody claims they know everything. You know I'm I'm from Afghanistan and I and I you know I I I'm the first to admit that most of us have no clue why things are happening. And so uh, looking into this objectively, trying to collect facts and data um, uh, in a culture, and we have we have a very strong culture of oral history. We don't we don't have many uh, written. It's, it's very limited from, from the experience of the 1992 collapse. There are only a very handful of books written many years later. And so trying to document this is also the contribution that we're trying to make to at least uh, try not to repeat it uh, in the future. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. Gabriel. Thank you a lot, Shwain. And we're, we're opening for questions now. So if you have questions, just let me know. And if you don't, I have one myself, if I'm still thinking. Okay, so I'll do for I'll go first where while well, people think about their questions. And I'm sort of like turning your question back to you again, Tribe, which is something that I mean gladly we're here together to do it. But so you talked a lot uh, about the 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 history of the collapse of Afghanistan from uh, from the from from within, like from the inside, how institutions institutions were collapsing, how uh, political actors were dealing with these uh, problems and all of it, and the role of the army and all. But I wonder uh, how was this perceived by Afghan population? And specifically, you were talking about the, bag, the impact of the Doha deal 
as being a deal between America and the Taliban. And I was wondering on how much of this uh, American uh, way of dealing with things uh, affected the way uh, Afghan people perceive democracy now. So I would like to hear a little bit more about how uh, how you see or if you have any ideas or researches on, on how Afghan people perceive democracy, but also what do you think is the role or the space for democracy in rebuilding uh, the Republic of Afghanistan? Uh, thank you very much for that question. So this is one of the, one of the uh, contested narratives that's out there where many Western policymakers or Eastern or whomever from outside claim that you know, democracy is not made for Afghanistan. You know, democracy is not the system made for a country like Afghanistan. Afghanistan is tribal, is this and that. And so that unfortunately is a very, um, how to say, colonial way of, of, of um, looking at a country which has strived for increased uh, citizen rights um, over a century. You know, like people, we had a parliament in, in uh, 1920s. We had a decade of uh, democracy. We we're moving towards greater increased uh, political rights, citizens' rights, uh, greater access to education uh, for women, greater political participation by uh, minorities uh, in the 1960s. Um, and so uh, 2001 in the international intervention created the space for all these various movements to um, re-emerge. So it breathed life into all of them, but they existed before and they are continuing to fight that good fight even now against the Taliban after the Americans have left. So the notion of democracy and having agency and having the right to determine um, you know, the, the, determine your fate, you know, and, and the fate of, you know, your life, your family's life and your country's life um, is something that was and has been very fundamental, but of course, cultural context, uh, cultural context matters. So uh, to your question, um, I think people were extremely energized at the beginning of the intervention. And that's why there was, there was great, uh, 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 participation and endorsement of the democratic process. This created space for a lot of civil society to also find their voice again after um, over a decade of civil war and war against the Taliban, um, where that space continue, uh, continued to shrink drastically. Um, uh, but unfortunately, when the, when the US and the West looked the other way when it came to corruption of, let's say, Hamid Karzai. Hamid Karzai's rule is known to be uh, uh, an extremely corrupt period where he endorsed, uh, implicitly endorsed and was directly involved in um, a lot of corrupt activities. And the fact that the US just looked the other way, for whatever reason it might be, compromised compromise the, the uh, weight and legitimacy of what it is, what's happening, you know, who's actually calling the shots. And then in 2014, um, so the, 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 this feeling was that the 2009 presidential elections that the people were robbed and Karzai continued a second term. So people, and the narrative domestically was that, well, Karzai is Washington's candidate. You know, the Americans want to continue working with him. So we have to accept him. You know, so, so, you know, democracy and the le legitimacy of the system becomes tainted. And then you have 2014, where it's massive election fraud. It's, you know, heavily disputed. The dispute goes on for about a year. And then you have John Kerry come in and form a national unity government. The same narrative is, is reinvigorated where, you know, at the end of the day, it's who the Americans choose who will sit in the palace. It's who the West, the West person has to be there. So, people realize that their vote doesn't really matter or is second class. And so that very strongly damaged the credibility of the democratic system 
uh, in the eyes of the uh, in the eyes of the people, and it fed into this Taliban narrative of well, you know, democracy is just a facade. You know, the games are being played behind the scenes, and so why are you defending a republic and you're defending a system which, at the end of the day, uh, is not uh, you know it doesn't it's not any different than any 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 other type of system, and so that although damaged the credibility, at the end of the day, people still recognized, because it's relative, people still recognize that within this um, uh, problematic uh, system called democracy or type of governance called democracy, we're still better off. We still have some fighting chance. At least, there's, there, there, at least there is recognition of our rights uh, if we can get better actors in charge, if we can be lobby, if we can do collective movements better, there is more space for us to improve on things compared to a full-on theocracy like the Taliban. And so, and so, um, unfortunately, our democratic experience in the past 20 years, you know, has been tainted, has been hurt, has been damaged, uh, and and drastically weakened by the same Democrats and liberal technocrats who claim to champion the system. Um, and so that is the tragedy of the of the 20 years where the promise of representation and the promise of a democratic system uh, was broken by the same by the same parties who were who benefited from it and, and, and who were and who were championing it and and um, and so it is very hard to uh, um, currently it's very hard to um, argue and push for. Uh, uh, democracy, but um, the Taliban are doing a great job of reminding everybody what people are missing out on. I mean, I know I'm framing it very differently, but um, I think that you have to understand that we had a generation who grew up in the past 20 years only recognizing, you know, a certain amount of rights, a certain amount of education access, media rights, uh, uh, women's rights and, and, and a higher level of participation in the public space. And now that you're taking that away from them, it is seen as a loss. It is seen as regressive. It is seen as uh, um, uh, suppression. And that is what's building up in greater and greater momentum um, uh, against the Taliban currently. Thank you, Shwaib. Do we have other questions? Looking at Professor Mark has a question. Hi, uh, I've really been happy to join today uh, and congratulations on putting together such a wonderful forum and, and particularly Shaib for your, uh, and Gabriella before, but uh, Shaib, your, your remarks, um, uh, which I, I haven't, I guess I have two questions. One kind of relates back to Gabriella's talk in, in, the, in the first half. And it's about um, kind of the ways in which one, uh, through constitutions and institutional design, how might um, a place like Afghanistan, as it is now, um, you know, structure a way in which a democratic polity um, can be both, you know, ruled through a, a, a unitary structure, but at the same time offer opportunities for uh, various you know, maybe peripheral parts of the country to be under a kind of, uh, you know, auto relative autonomy um, or, or even high autonomy. I, I'm thinking as a person who works on China and been thinking and writing a lot about Hong Kong and, and watching, you know, Hong Kong's very unusual kind of post-colonial status as a, as a semi-autonomous uh, region of, of, of China, but wiped out, of course, in the last couple of years by, by Beijing. Uh, so, uh, you know, in, in a, if you were designing and thinking about, as I'm sure you are, the future of Afghanistan, is there a way to, um, you know, avoid the, the, the mistakes uh, of the past in which there may was too much centralization out of Kabul and, and not enough, uh, you know, autonomy given to local governments? I, I really don't know. Maybe it was the other way where there was too much autonomy given uh, to regions that were then, you know, um, brought under control by forces that, that then opposed the, the central government. So that, that's one question. And then a second question uh, relates to something I'm not sure you've, you've mentioned yet, but just as we read you know, in the Western press about these incredibly uh, just heart-rending accounts of the, sanction, the effects of the sanctions, uh, you know, where, where literally people are starving and dying, um, 
it, it, what would be your your uh, you know recommendation to the U.S. government, uh, the Biden administration, vis-a-vis -vis sanctions? You know, uh, I know why they're in place, but isn't this a case where uh, they seem to be, uh, you know, just in a, in, in a basic principle of humanity that that you have to you have to lift parts of them anyway, even though you're going to be, um, you know, doing business with or allowing trade with the, the Taliban. So two, two kind of separate questions, one very policy oriented and the other a little more abstract. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Fraser. On the first question, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. I think this issue of, the, there's a big debate on decentralization. And this debate has been going on um, uh, for over two decades. And uh, the roots of this debate are after um, the Soviet invasion, when you had non-Pashtun ethnicities who had little role to play in the rule of the country in the past two centuries, all of a sudden finding themselves empowered and finding themselves uh, armed and finding themselves uh, defending their own territory and then eventually um, uh, winning and regaining control. And so what happened was that, what happened was that because Afghanistan is uh, an extremely multi-ethnic, multicultural, multilingual society, um, um, the cat was out of the box. You couldn't put it back in. You couldn't go back to the old system where there was only one clan. And so it's one sub-tribe of a tribe, which was ruling for long periods of time because among the among the uh, the Pashtun ethnicity you have the eastern Pashtun the southern Pashtuns and then there are a lot of breakdowns so only one of those tribes were leading and were formed a monarchy for over a century and so the big debate on decentralization um, uh, was where on one side you had the uh, a majority of the non-Pashtuns which were the Tajiks the Hazaras and the Uzbeks who collectively form over 60% of the country um, because there is no outright majority arguing that, look, um, we need greater autonomy in our regions. Our cultures are different. Our language is different. Our priorities are different. And so we need to have a say in who is the governor in the district. The village chief is appointed from Kabul, from the palace. That is the extent of centralization that Afghanistan system has. And so people are arguing, hey, look, we need to hold the governor accountable, the mayor accountable, because they're not responding to us. They're responding to somebody in Kabul. So they, they can, they're doing whatever it is they want to do, and we have hold no power over them. Um, and so that, that compromises the, the, you know, the accountability and legitimacy of, of, of the rule. So that's one side. The flip side of the argument uh, mostly introduced by, uh, by Pashtuns is if we open up the system, this might become grounds for cessation and, and breaking of the country. And we might lose the territorial integrity of Afghanistan. So that's generally the, generally the uh, main thrust of the argument. And also there's an argument of you know, order. We have to maintain order. Um, but I think now where we are, where we are today is that um, for the first time in um, our country's history, there are public, public outcries of cessation. And this was never the case. Even the most extreme federalist, you know, who would say we need a federal system, more greater autonomy, never uh, uh, claimed or argued that we should uh, separate as a country. But now people are making Making those calls because they're realizing that this, this conversation, this debate is not moving forward. And so there is greater space. And so if, if we were to, thinking ahead, if we were to look at uh, designing a constitution, which we exactly had that opportunity in 2004, and the exact same debate was taking place, but it was strong-armed, unfortunately, by technocrats like Khalil Zad, like Ashraf Ghani, who had convinced Washington, D.C., saying, look, if you want a reliable partner, you have to have a strong central government, and we are that person. And so they strong-armed, and a lot of you know, backdoor deals took place 
to uh, make it an extremely powerful presidency and eventually that, that constitution led to the collapse. Um, um, so a constitution which recognizes greater center periphery relations, greater autonomy of the periphery uh, and recognize that diversity I think will be far more stable. And we've, we've, we have that experience during the sixties where the king appointed a prime minister. So the king and the monarch led the foreign relations and the prime minister formed cabinet and led the day-to-day -day of the government. Uh, so that's to, that's to the first debate. And it's extremely a, a polarized debate across ethnic lines, this, this conversation. And so, uh, but it is a very much relevant uh, uh, um, uh, conversation taking place. On the issue of um, the humanitarian uh, aid and the policy regarding that, I think this is, there are, two, there are two camps. One camp is arguing that um, um, humanitarian aid trumps everything. We should not politicize it and we should go ahead and, um, and uh, provide the assistance through any means possible. Uh, it doesn't really matter who's in charge. That's one camp. The second camp is arguing that you have to provide humanitarian assistance, but you cannot be blind to the, to the actors involved because if you are not smart about disseminating resources, dispersing resources, you are empowering the same group which will then use that newfound resource to go ahead and kill or suppress the same people you're trying to save. So it can, it can, it should not be a blind dis, dis, dispersion of, of humanitarian aid. And, and this was the conversation post-August. Now, nine months after the collapse, this debate has changed because the Taliban initially were claiming, oh, we have reformed, we have changed, the world can work with us. But as their grip becomes stronger and stronger, what we are seeing and what the world is seeing, and for people like me and for the people of Afghanistan, this came to as no surprise. This is exactly what we saw after 96 when they captured Kabul. It was a gradual suffocation of society and holding everybody hostage. And so with the, with the shutdown of the uh, uh, middle school and high school for girls, with the shutdown of um, uh, foreign media across the country, with the torture and imprisonment of journalists, with the targeting of former civil servants and security sector officials, despite the public amnesty call, with the systematic um, displacement of certain populations and, and uh, because of an ethnic uh, agenda, unfortunately. I think that the uh, international community is realizing, hey, you know, maybe we need to be a bit more careful the way we are dispersing this aid. And so there's, and there's no magic bullet uh, um, uh, because I think the aid system is broken. The aid system uh, uh, is um, running on this very self-serving notion of, oh, the UN or UNDP has to get their cut. So they, they argue for increased budget, increased pledging, uh, of funding and aid, but what they don't do is they don't hold the uh, de facto authorities accountable. Look, we just gave you $50 million. Why have you held and, and uh, imprisoned 14 girls who were protesting for the opening of schools? That conversation is not being held by the aid agencies inside the country because it's decoupled. They want that, and that decoupling, I think, has created a lot of space for the Taliban, where essentially they go, look, you know, the people will go hungry, you have to feed them, you know, it's not my responsibility. So you're the one who's not helping. So they're effectively holding the population hostage. So it's a very tricky, uh, uh, tricky uh, puzzle to solve. Uh, but everyone is basically um, arguing um, uh, to make sure that we help people at, but at the same time, not empower the same people who are uh, suppressing the same population. Thank you, Shoaib. Do we have any more questions? We have, we just have a little time. So if anyone has a question, it has to be very short. No? No? Okay, so, well, thank you all for coming today and thank you for being here this morning. We still have one presentation left on Thursday at 10 o'clock 
to be a bit earlier because we do have a coffee session where you can meet us in person just outside the library. So if you manage to be here at the new school, we'll be more than happy to chat with you in person and share a little bit more about our experience here and all of it. Thank you all for coming. Thank you uh, to the politics department for this chance to be host holding these sessions all together and showing a little bit of our work to you. And I'll see you on Thursday.